without any further ado, Bob Osborne. Hello, everybody. Well, I've just listened to um, Lucy's and Sandy's talks, and uh, a lot of the information that they've given you um, corresponds with a lot of the research I've been doing over the many years regarding uh, Agenda 21, Agenda 30, Operation Lockstep, um, the Venetians, uh, the, the Huxleys. So I'm not going to go over that ground again, um, other than say how it relates to me and uh, my particular way of gathering information, which is slightly different from, from theirs, which is probably more academic. Anyway, to recap, I'm Bob Osborne, I'm a writer, I'm an artist, and I live in this really weird place called Zena, which is right at the end of the Cornwall, uh, five miles beyond land, uh, St Ives. Now, this is a very strange place. It's nestled up between the moors and the ocean. Um, it's also a centre of paranormal activity, and I've got a long ancestral history of my DNA being in that place because uh, 500 years ago we had a, a tin mine there, and uh, I've been going backwards and forwards to St Ives the last 30 years as an artist. I've had studios in St Ives, and I moved to Zena four years ago permanently um, because I knew what was happening with. Operation Lockstep with the lockdowns, with the depopulation agenda. And I'm not really going to go over what Sandy and Lucy have said, but if I had to put it in a nutshell, we are in the final stages of a transhumanist agenda. And uh, this is run on a, on a belief system that is Luciferian. So some of that I'll touch on when we go through. So I'm going to look at some images. I haven't prepared anything. I'm not a public speaker. So it's a bit chatty. And I might go off on a stream of consciousness uh, but I'm going to try and uh, stick to the images that are coming up on the screen because some of the information I've gathered is, is kind of really unique. And this book has got me in a bit of trouble. But all my books get me in trouble. And I've been in trouble all my life. So I think in order to, to establish how I gather information and, and how my work is, is put together, um, I just need to say a few things about my childhood. So uh, this is a really strange story, so I'll keep it brief. Um, and I'm writing a book about it called Be Lucky, which is coming out next year. So effectively, on my father's side, I'm from a Roman gypsy background. So six, seven generations ago, one of my ancestors, Alexander Osborne, took part in the Monmouth Rebellion, which was an attempt to overthrow the monarchy. Basically, they were mercenaries picked up by the Duke of Monmouth. And it was called the Pitchfork um, Rebellion. Fortunately, my ancestor escaped um, Judge Jeffries was hunting these people down, uh, putting their entrails on trees. They were hung, drawn, quartered, sent as slaves to the Caribbean. My ancestor escaped and was in hiding for two years. And they were branded, um, the people that escaped were branded rebel not taken, which was one of the best things that Judge Jeffries ever done because he gave me my art brand. So I've got rebel not taken tattooed on my arm. I had a clothing range called rebel not taken. Um, and effectively that explained to me um, why am I in my DNA I have such a rebellious streak and I have such a problem with authority? Um, so on my father's side, Roman gypsies. My father couldn't read or write. He's one of 18. So the fact that I then was able to read or write, went to university, studied creative writing at East Anglia, for me, I've always had a kind of um, a really odd way of gathering information because they're also psychics. Now, on my mother's side, there's also a lot of psychic and a lot of insanity. Um, my, my great uncle was, was, uh, has a Nephilim bloodline, which I'll explain when we go, go through one of the slides. So there's psychic um, activity on both sides of my family. There's also a lot of mediums. And all through my childhood, I was doing, uh, I was traveling back to Venice. I was uh, seeing ghosts, lo loads and loads of paranormal activity, lots of synchronicity. Um, I could never work out what, what, why all this was happening. Um, when I was seven, I could play chess at a high level, even though none of my family could read or write. I'm the first male in my line to be able to read or write. So the fact that I've written loads of books is kind of, you know, I feel that's a major achievement. Uh, I could play chess. I didn't know how I could play chess. I got um, tested on at school, obviously, because um, they picked up on my psychic stuff. And also, being from a very dysfunctional background, I was fast-tracked to go to a... I wouldn't say a military school, but it was a, a Freemason school run on uh, uh, RAF, run, run on military lines. So when I went there, uh, Lucy's talked about the Gorton Foundation. Well, they were doing IQ tests and they were testing children, so I was tested. And um, it, I was deemed to be ha having special abilities. So um, 
also at that time, when I was 11, both my grandparents stuck their head in the gas oven. So I went through a lot of trauma. I was um, fostered out to one of my mother's friends who was a prostitute. So while I'm at this military school, all this is going on. I then went back to live with my father. It's not all doom and gloom because um, we had a monkey called Wanker and a parrot called Fuck Off. <laughs> so we would go out on a horse and cart. You know, we were also hobnobbing with, with a lot of um, actors and actresses. So they, the gypsies move in strange worlds and they have kind of ability to, to uh, a, they have a, a very good uh, sense of danger, uh, and also being psychic on both sides of my family. Um, I eventually jacked out of school. They, they were testing me. I, I, I was being tested all the time. Um, I ended up going to University of East Anglia to study creative writing, which was a good choice because they wanted me to go to Oxford and Cambridge. I was also trying to... They love people from my kind of background to, to go into the military military intelligence or um, MI5 uh, because you know, you, you've got a way of connecting information that, that, that isn't logical or linear. So I found that I had that ability of gathering information. So I didn't go to Oxford and Cambridge, thankfully. I went to East Anglia, but in retrospect, quite agree with what Lucy said about it being the centre of the climate change hoax. Um, so at that time, I didn't know what was going on. After that, briefly, um, I travelled around, I was a poet, I, I travelled around the Greek islands, living very free, um, very hedonistic. Um, I, I, in 76, I was fortunate to meet Robert Graves, who was, uh, you might know, he wrote a seminal book called The White Goddess. Now, Graves was a big influence on me, as was D.H. Lawrence and Alistair Crowley. Um, so it was, it was Graves that, that taught me the analytic process of, of gathering information, which I can go into when we, when we talk about, or we see some slides about Graves, that links into how Graves was instrumental in, in Huxley's used his information to, to, to set up MKUltra and the mind control program that has been run by Joseph Sargent, uh, William Sargent that is, and um, uh, Cameron in, in, in Canada. So all this information, um, I, I've always had a, co a connection to, to Cornwall, to Zenor, because recently I've been made the Earl of Tregrathen by um, King Arthur Pendragon, who some of you may know is a very eccentric character, but he's the reincarnation of King Arthur. And I now live in Tregerthen, which is just a tiny village outside Zeno. And this was the, the farm where, in, in 1917, D.H. Lawrence and a load of occultists and other people created a very bizarre commune. So uh, I was kind of sent to, to Zeno in, in, in many ways. To, 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 and I thought, I'd write a little book about D.H. Lawrence because I've always been interested in him. He's the son of a coal miner. I'm the son of a gypsy. We both are not really accepted by the uh, academic establishment, and, and I kind of feel an affinity with Lawrence. So when I'm now living on the farm where in 1916, 1917 he lived, it's almost like I'm inhabiting his psyche. Um, so I have the ability to, to gather information through this analytic process. So Zenor, um, I know several people here have been to Zenor, um, including Miles and Miriam and, and a couple of other people have, who know it. It's a really weird place. I mean, it's the centre of a witch's triangle between uh, Madron and Morva. And I've been living there permanently for four years now, and again, I've been thrown back in that situation where I'm in the centre of a lot of occult and a paranormal activity. So, uh, you know, part of, part of the premise of the book I wrote, which is um, Zen the Spirit Place, I decided to write this book about a year ago, uh, and I did some deep research in, into Lawrence. And then what I found out was absolutely blew my mind because I was, I was going into um, areas with, with Fabianism, with, with you know, the, the depopulation agenda, which we're going through now. Um, aliens, you know, Crowley black magic. Uh, you know, it, there was no end to it. And I, I, was, I was able through the analytic process to access a lot of information. So. I published an edition of 666 copies, which was a bit of a joke on my behalf. Um, they all sold out. Um, I got a lot of um, threats from, from various people about information that, that I put in there. I also made a documentary film, which was brilliant because I've always wanted to make a film. And this was um, uh, some old footage, you know, a bit of a, a collage. And again, I used a lot of information that I'd gathered that hadn't been seen before. And this won awards at film festivals, and uh, you know, was my, I've taken it off now because um, uh, some legal challenges. So basically, in, in the four years that I've been living at, um, at Zeno, um, 
this was what I did last year. And um, when, when I look at the book, um, that cover, it's one of those places where I get a lot of people come in and they want to go up to, to the house where Crowley lived, where he, you know, performed the Black Magic ritual, where, which he summoned a Draco reptilian, which he resulted in the death of, of, of a famous Fabian. Um, I take them around these places, and, and that little particular portal is called the Kissing Stones. And when I was writing the book and doing the film, I got um, Bar Miller, you know, she's the, the widow of Hamish Miller, lovely lady who's 90 now, and she came out and doused it. And also, I know Pauldon Jenkins, um, I interviewed, and I think someone was talking to someone about, about Pauldon, he laid out all the grids um, in West Penwith. So these are two people who really have a deep understanding about ley lines and, and the grid energies. And uh, th this particular place is one of my go-to places for channeling. And um, when I take people there, I say, what do you see? And they say, well, we just see a couple of rocks. And A, the rocks are very much like Barbara Hepworth's sculptures. Now, Barbara Hepworth talked about the influence of the Pagan Hills, which is that whole stretch of coastline um, where I now live. But when, when I looked at it, what I see is on the, on the left, um, I see a long skulled alien presence. And on the right, I, I see a sphinx or a lion or a cat. Um, now, I didn't know whether that's my overactive imagination or, or the fact that, that I'm channeling through, through the spirit of place, because one of, the, one of the big premises of this book is that when you live in a place where there's so much um, energies uh, and also a lot of occult activity, you know, you, it's, you, you can transform your senses and you, you can gather this information and draw up this information from the earth. So when I looked at that, I saw Bast. Um, now, Bast is the Egyptian goddess of, um, of witchcraft, of black magic, also of pregnancy and childbirth. And um, Bast is very interesting because when I, look, when I looked at Bast, I think that's part of the feminist, um, not the feminist, but, but, the, but the female deity that Robert Graves wrote about in The White Goddess is that before... We had the patriarchal system, we had the, the matriarchal system, which corresponds to the Eon of Isis, as opposed to the Eon of Osiris. So in the, in the matriarchal system, there wasn't so much marriage, and obviously it was much more of, of an intuitive um, you know, way, way of inhabiting. And a lot of the um, research I did on the book, I, I then got into Egyptian symbology, um, a bit about you know, UFOs, but certainly a lot about transhumanism. And um, the thing about Bast is that I think that's where the word bastard comes from, um, because um, at that time there was unregulated sex. And um, also catting. So one of Robert Groves' best poems is called The, the Cat Goddess. So there's all this goddess um, to do with, with, with cats, and, uh, and of course it relates to... I'm sorry, I'm, I'm a very stream of consciousness, whatever comes in my head, but it relates to, to Montauk, because... Um, it goes on to Babylon there, who, who was the mother of abominations, who Crowley used to summon, summon Babylon in, in his sex magic rituals, which I've taken part in. Um, so Babylon connects to, to the female energy, and Bar Miller told me that the, 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 that's a portal. You now, this portal is all over um, Cornwall, so that's the portal. And I think even we were talking about Casbolt earlier, when um, Casbolt used to go down to, um, to see uh, UFOs, and, uh, and he... At that time, I think I saw an interview when he was in St. Ives um, that he did with Mars, when he talked about being a portal from man's head to Pluto. And at the time, I thought, oh, this is great, it's a great story, but having lived there for four years, it doesn't seem so fanciful now. Um, so that's definitely a portal, and that's a portal that goes down to the Holy Land. And there's another place called the Menantol, which is of significance for me on, on the Cornish Moors. And that's a fertility symbol. It's just a circle with a, with a kind of a penis rock. And it's been there, you know, for donkey's years. And one of the um, claims made by one of Alistair Crowley's sons, well, supposed sons, is that Crowley opened a portal between the Menantol and Montauk. Uh, now, I'm sure you will know about Montauk and the Montauk chair. Um, and the, that's called the elementary working. And uh, this portal, you know, is because Zenor is on this grid that, that links to, um, Montauk links to, to Egypt and, and to Mars with the pyramids. And of course, um, there's cats at, wild cats at Montauk um, that are called the Montauk cats. And what they do, they lead the visitors down into um, underground chambers. 
So this, all, this whole underground system that, that goes on at um, the Anzena with, with the fujus, um, the burial chambers. So <sighs> what I'm saying is that Lawrence tapped into this energy is because he... The minute he set foot in, in Zeno, he, he just thought it was the most incredible place because he's very much into blood consciousness. And blood consciousness taps into a lot of the sex rituals that were taken out by, by the, uh, the mystery schools in, in Greece and, uh, and Egypt. So, you know, a lot of these um, magic rituals were to do with the fact that portals um, can be opened and, and, and the female energy at that time, you know, there's a lot of orgiastic rites that were going on to do with you know reproduction fertility and certainly people like Lawrence and and Crowley and Robert Graves three people who one I knew um, and two have had a co you know influence on, on my work um, all tapped into this and I think you know when you can go and humanize you can tap into this energy and you can tap into this information you know it takes on a whole new perspective so uh, yeah just a brief personal story I mean uh, the way I do my work, it's almost like method writing. So, um, you know, I, I like to engage physically with, with what I'm doing. And it, inevitably, when I'm working on a project or writing a book, I then immerse myself in it and I almost become, it takes over my life uh, and, and things happen to me, you know, in a, in a kind of very synchronistic way. So, on that photograph, that's taken in the Tinner's Arms. Now, at, at Zenar, it's really wild and remote, and the only signs of civilization are the Tinner's Arms pub which was built in 1100 for Freemasons, and St. Sonara Church, which is the, the church where the Mermaid of Zenon myth is. So, so that looks down to Mermaid Cove, where the, the mermaids or the chimeras or the hybrids or the, or the creatures from Atlantis you know, appear. And there's a whole story about that, which I was going to talk about at Glastonbury next week, but uh, I'm not going to do that now. So on that picture... Um, I'm in that pub, and the, the, the girl sitting next to me, um, I've taken out the picture because she doesn't want the publicity, but anyway, she was my girlfriend at the time. She turned up two years ago um, at my cottage at Tregertha and, and told me that uh, she was very beautiful, Romanian, told me that she was in the Illuminati and that had been inducted to Rome, into Rome, and inevitably I ended up, you know, she moved in with me. And uh, when I started researching this book, within... Um, during that first year before it's finished, I've got a tattooed of the Mermaid of Zeno on my arm. I've got Do What, Do what Thou Wilt tattooed across my back. Um, I've got a book which was thankfully a sellout of an edition of 666 called Zeno Spirit of Place and also a documentary film. So we then got into Toth, Tara Toth um, reading. So, you know, we, we got heavily into the occult and um, we did a, a, a sex magic uh, ritual up on the Menantol, and within a year, now I've got a child called Zena, a one-year-old child called Zena, and you know I was 69 at that time, so and she's 32. So this is the kind of thing that happens, you know. Uh, and for me, it all it all links up t to me writing that book and getting that information and having to actually experience um, the things that I did. Um, you know, that, that's a bit of a gypsy way of looking at things, but, but I, I relate it to the fact that, that, that through my physical experiences, I, I'm able to tap into things that people wouldn't normally do, and also because I can make incredible connections between things that people don't see those connections, and, and I think that's, you know, it's a shortcut, and that's to do with, with Graves' analeptic method. So if I can work this technology... Um, Yeah, these stones, um, anyone who's been on the Xenomores, uh, these are incredible. This whole structure's up there that, that are not put in stone henish down, but it makes it look like a, like a, like a, you know, a semi-detached. Uh, and these great big cities up there. And the rumours are, now, th these for me are, as Bar Miller said, there's a serpent energy, and the, the book that Hamish Miller wrote is called The Sun and the Serpent. So underneath, there's, there's this serpent energy which connects to the Illuminati. Um, so the whole snake symbolism, you know, D.H. Lawrence worked through symbolism. So the poem, The Snake, I mean, that was written at, at Tregerthen, where I now live. Um, there's all these fossilized uh, structures, and um, I see them as serpents or lizards or snakes. And when Lawrence was on the moors, he was tapping into this... Um, uh, sense that, that DNA is embedded in, in, in the place. 
So uh, when rituals are taking place on rocks, uh, you, you know, uh, you can summon entities from underground as well uh, using trance-like states. So there's things called dolmens, uh, which were the, the burial um, sites of, of giants or, or, or kings of the tribe. And um, in my garden, I've got a, a koi, which is like a capstone, and, and that's where back in the day they would put dead bodies on there for the, for the carrion to pick the flesh called excarnation, and they'd bury the bones underneath in the little chamber. Um, and of course, the, the old pre-pagan belief system was that bones are like memory sticks that, that, that carry your DNA. And, um, and by then doing trance-like states or, or rituals, uh, you know, you can summon up the energy of your ancestors. And certainly that, that was one of Lawrence's strong beliefs that, that um, you can tap into this pagan energy. And um, up on the moors there, you know, I've always taken people up there. And of course, that's where Alistair Crowley's activities were. And um, I could go on and on about that, so, but I've got to move on quickly because otherwise um, we're going to get stuck down stuff. So apart from those incredible um, structures, there's a lot of mythology around which I really also have researched about fairies. Um, Miles has mentioned knockers. Knockers are, are the spirits that inhabit the mines. There's spriggans who, who lead people ast astray. Um, you know, the, the usual little pixies and things like that. I mean, a lot of them are used, for, 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 you know, in the mermaid myths as well. But the one that particularly interested me was, was the, uh, the giant um, mythologies. So there's a giant called Cormoran who um, lived at St. Michael's Mount, which is another big... Um, <laughs> let's, let's say there's, there's a lot of stuff going in the dungeons there that has always been going on. And the rumour was that, that Cormoran lived under St. Michael's Mount and he used to go and take cattle and, and, and food and vegetables from the farms. So clearly this relates to, to the David and Goliath and the Nephilim, you know, the giants that, that ruled the world. And, and one of the beliefs among the Cornish that the reason all these structures are up there is that the giants used to toss them around, um, you know, and, and have wars with each other. And they had to get rid of Cormoran from St. Michael's Mount. So there was a guy called um, Jack the Giant Killer who, who actually... Um, chipped him up and cut his head off with an axe. So they got rid of the giant, uh, and this became the myth. And then in the 19th century, they found that the skeleton of a, a man who was seven foot eight, I think, underneath St. Michael's Mount. Um, and that all got... Anyway, re regarding me, um, when I read this story, I'd also previously done all the research on my great-uncle on my mother's side. And that's my great-uncle in the middle there. He's called George the Giant Auger. And in 1900, he was Queen Victoria's bodyguard, and he was also um, proposed as the tallest man in the world. His height was between 7 foot 11 and 8 foot 4. So I had the BBC interview me about him, and um, you know they said, oh, it's giganticism. And I was explaining that it's a Nephilim throwback. You know, the Nephilim were, were, were the fallen, um, the giants that, that, that <laughs> we, all, we know what they got up to. Anyway, that's um, Harold Lloyd. Silent movie for, uh, and that's Francesco Lintini. Now, he at the time, my great uncle George got picked up at Barnum and Bailey Circus to take to New York to appear in the freak shows, uh, which is great, you know, because I've always been fascinated by freaks and, um, you know, coming from a very eccentric family, it kind of fits in really. So, he, in 1907, he decided to, to write his own play, so he wrote a play called uh, Jack the Giant Killer which he went on to the New York stage to, to, to perform for 10 years and then became a celebrity in, in, uh, in America. And he was going to pick up by Hal Roach to be in the silent movies with, with, uh, with Harold Lloyd. And I've got lots of photographs of um, a film with Charlie Chaplin. Uh, unfortunately, they're all owned by Getty because I wanted to write the story. But then I realised that the link between Jack, Jack the Giant Killer in, 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 in Penzance, you know, where I've got... DNA history going back hundreds of years. And um, him, it's just another one of those incredible coincidences. Uh, that's all I was saying on that. Um, now, getting on to Lawrence, um, really interesting. Um, when I first went there, I'd always had the thing about Lawrence, because uh, Women in Love was my favourite book. And, and as I said, I studied literature and I devoured books all, all through my, um, when I was living in Greece and places. And in 1917, Lawrence was escaping from what was going on with the First World War. 
decided to set up a, a, a commune, a utopian commune, in his term, a Shangri-La. So he wanted to move as far away from, from London as possible, a bit like I did four years ago when, when the, the, you know, the, the population agenda started. So I decided to go back to, to Zenor. Uh, he lived here in this cottage. Uh, those buildings at the back, that's Tregurthen Farm, that's where I now live. And that, you know, he rented these for five pound a year to set up this commune with a whole load of people. And when I started writing the book, I think, I'll just write a book about Lawrence. Then I found out all the other people that were involved, all, all the occultists, people like Virginia Woolf, um, Peter Warlock, um, all the links to Alistair Crowley, that, that, that really there was something really weird going on there. And then there was all the Nazi stuff as well that came later, the Nazis' obsession with Cornwall, you know, with the ley lines, the ley line wars that, that Himmler was running. And um, so then I started going down all, all these different rabbit holes. And um, that's effectively where he ran a commune with his German wife, uh, Frieda von Richthofen. So when, when I um, have, have done, like, showed my film and, and, and did Q&As with the book, um, two of the things that people asked me all the time was, what was the true nature of, of uh, Lawrence's sexuality? And were he and Frieda spying for the Germans? Because, um, you know, I subsequently found out that Lawrence was having an affair with the farmer that owned my house, uh, another... Um, another bit of synchronicity uh, and, and also deconstructed the whole thing about um, Frieda being German, uh, her cousin w was the Red Baron and then I came to the conclusion that um, yeah, in those days it wasn't cut and dry, basically they were used as agents for, for the New World Order um, as were a lot of other people and of course the, the connection between Lawrence and, and the Huxley family, um, you know, which I'm not going to go into so much because that's being covered in a much more professional way by, by uh, the two ladies that are talking about them. But, you know, the, the correspondences are incredible. So I, I now live on, on that place. So it, it's almost like I can inhabit, I'm inhabiting Lawrence's space. And I also can inhabit his psyche because I have dreams and then, then I can channel information. Coincidences are off the scale. You know, they made a great film about it, um, Ken, uh, Ken Russell. Ollie Reed played, um, uh, played John Middleton Murray. I used to go drinking with Ollie Reed. That's not a good thing to do, by the way. Um, so, you know, it's just like it's constant, uh, you know, constant um, coincidences that are just too many to, to, uh, to take in. So basically, he formed a commune, but it wasn't just him. He went with Frida, uh, and also some of the people that, that joined this commune, I started researching them, and I got, you know, I got most incredible um, things happening. Um, I'll go through them briefly. Um, this is one of the guys. He was um, Philip Hesseltine. Uh, he, was, um, he wrote a fabulous piece called The Curly, and, and he was part of the, that pre-First World War. Very aristocratic. He's, his uncle had, uh, was a Rembrandt collector. He was under the influence of, um, of Crowley, as a lot of Lawrence's contemporaries were. Uh, also, having read, you know, Blavatsky and, and, and Eliphas Levi, they were researching how to, to summon demons. And the fact that all these, there's many others as well, there's about half a dozen of them black magic magicians that all hung around with Lawrence. The fact that they've come down to, to, to Zenor and lived in Tregurthen, you know, is because of the spirit of place. They, they knew that they could get information out of the earth and they, they could do their rituals and, and do their, uh, you know, increase their occult power. So... I mean, having written about, I've done a chapter on all these people in the book, so there's a lot of detail in there about their personal lives, and really it's like a, an absolute, because I come from, from a, a very eccentric family, I uh, had very strange things, even I was thinking, God, these, th these families, you know, they're absolutely nuts, I mean, but they were very rich as well, so they were able to indulge their passions. So he... He changed his name to Peter Warlock after coming down the influence of Crowley. Who, Crowley is extremely significant um, in the counterculture movement uh, and also the espionage movement. And three, the three things that really interest me and always, always fascinated me are art and literature, um, the occult, um, because I come from a psychic background and, and I've been... Someone said to me, yeah, there's still witches in Zeno. I said, yeah, they're all my ex-girlfriends. Um, <laughs> Uh, and also espionage because I, I've got con connections or through marriage with, with MI5 and um, uh, anyway, I'm not going to go into that. 
Um, but that's also a very significant factor down there. And there's a lot of espionage taking place between the Nazis and, and the, the Cornish landowners. And a lot of these artists and, and musicians were also in military intelligence. I mean, this is another thing I found out. It wasn't just one or two. Most of them, all through the lot, Fleming, um, you know, they were all seconded into, into the psychic war that we were going, we, we were having, because all, all the wars were cult wars. So even the ley line, um, the ley line people, you know, were, were being used, uh, you know, the Fortune and, and all the others to 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 tap into other people's en other enemies' energies. Turns out he he died uh, young, and Crowley said it was a black magic ritual went, that went wrong. It turns out later that his son, one of his one of his illegitimate children, was, was Brian Sewell, the art critic. But there's loads more. It's all in the book. Um, yeah. The other couple that were fascinating that moved in with Lawrence were, I don't know if anyone, I'm talking about people, I'm assuming that there's some knowledge about these figures, but that's um, obviously Lawrence, so that's Frieda in the middle. That's John Middleton Murray, and that's Catherine Mansfield. Might have heard of those very eminent um, writers and intellectuals before the First World War, and they were very much part of that Bloomsbury Fabian crowd. And they were also heavily into the occult. So Lawrence went down to, to share this um, cottage with, with Middleton Murray, and that's where he started writing Women in Love, which was the novel that he wrote with Trebeth, and I'm very glad about that, because it's my favorite. And the, the, the draft manuscript for that was called Goats and Compasses, so you can imagine that Lawrence is attacking what he would call Cambridgeism, Advancism, Fabianism, sodomy, you, you know, all, the, all those things that, that the upper class is engaged in. Uh, Lawrence had a very ambivalent attitude towards it, even though he was you know, bisexual himself. But the, what they got up to down there with... with Frida was an infomaniac as well. Um, Lawrence was shagging the farm and that owned, you know, in, in the hayfields, and they were doing rituals up on the moors. And uh, you've only got to read his letters or his symbolism, you know, to, to realise that, you know, and also I've done interviews with, with descendants of the family who are very upset that, that I exposed Stanley Hawking as being one of Lawrence's lovers. So, you know, to a certain extent, I said, look, it's 100 years ago, but they were up to all sorts. They were also um, doing a lot of hallucinogenic drugs. Catherine Mansfield um, uh, was living with, with Frida. Uh, John Middleton Murray was her husband. He was also in military intelligence. Uh, both of these people were, were also involved with Crowley. She used to take um, peyote with Crowley in 1917. They both, she wrote a book called um, The Triumph for Pan. Now, Pan is central to Luciferian belief systems, and it's also central t to the whole Gaia principle and, and, and the New Age, um, uh, the, the New Age um, trap uh, and the Age of Aquarius trap as well, which is basically a Luciferian trap. So they got involved with New Age movements at a very early stage. Um, she then went to, to she had gonorrhea. She had a one-day marriage. Um, she, she, she was, um, they were all very highly sexed, and clearly th that was being, intensified by their time spent at Zeno. Uh, so they created quite a lot of havoc among the local community until they were thrown out, and they were thrown out supposedly for spying for the Germans. Um, but I think it's mainly because they, they were leading such debauched lives. Catherine Mansford went to work with Gurdjieff in the um, Gurdjieff Foundation. for So they, they were involved in that early, uh, all that spiritual movement. Um, she actually died quite young, and Gurdjieff had a place in Fontainebleau and one of the interesting theories that I like is the fact that Asda Crowley also had a, a, a practice in, in, in Fontainebleau, just outside Paris. And Crowley was keeping an eye on Gurdjieff, and that Gurdjieff was actually a British agent called Frederick Duttle um, from the East End uh, with, with a fake. But that happens all the time, you know, and especially when you go through the guru movement, you realise that a lot of them are, are groomed or, you know, parts of, of British intelligence. So that's them. Yeah, very interesting um, time there. But there's a whole chapter on them. Um, th this is Frieda, Frieda von Richthofen. Now, when I researched Frieda von Richthofen, that really gave me the key into how Lawrence was used um, to promote the counterculture agenda and how he was used by the Huxleys uh, and the Fabians um, in order to promote various agendas. Because Frieda was fr from a, a German aristocratic military background, um, Freemasons, no doubt. And um, that's her two sisters. So there's Elsa and um, 
Nusha, I think it was. Now they, before the war, were extremely bohemian and they were part of a, a social circle that were bringing in the whole concepts of, of, of free love, of, of um, uh, anti anti patriarchy, anti establishment. You know, but to a certain extent, they were early honey trap girls. Um, both her sisters, well, she had an affair with um, uh, the economics, uh, German economics minister, the, the, the Webers and the Jaffers. So between them, they had various children by, by the same men, uh, even before Frieda met Lawrence. And according to Brenda Malix, who wrote the autobiography of Frieda, within 20 minutes of meeting Lawrence, she was in bed with him. So uh, she had three children. Uh, she abandoned this whole thing to go and live in this commune in Ascona, which is highly significant. Um, Frieda's cousin was, was the Red Baron, um, Manfred von Richthofen, who was the, like, the flying machine of, of the German Empire. And, um, you know, so she, it's really strange that they turn up in 1917 in this remote village in Zeno. And it's no wonder they're suspicious because um, she's singing Bavarian songs and, uh, you know, they're both anti, um, a you know, they're both pro German, you, you know, philosophically anyway. Um, so what that led on to um, was that there was a commune in Ascona that was the precursor to a lot of the communes that were established in, certainly the Zeno one was an early one. Um, Frieda von Richthofen was living in this commune with Otto Gross, who is a psychiatrist there. And she was, she was in love with Otto Gross. He's a very significant figure in the, uh, the psychiatric movement, influenced uh, Carl Jung, Yats Jung there. So uh, Otto Gross w w was completely out of control. He was an anarchist. Um, he was the, one of the first people to establish uh, assisted suicide, but he, he practiced on two of his mistresses that he wanted to get rid of. He ended up in an, a criminal asylum, but at the same time, he established, or he, he was put forward to establish this branch of, of what they call anti-psychiatry, which, which was to be leading on to, to, to Freud. Um, now, Freud w was very influenced by, and Freud wanted Jung, uh, wanted uh, Gross to take over his form of depth psychology. So this whole um, psychiatric movement w w was kind of started at this commune where Frieda, w was, as a young girl, was, was living in this almost like free bohemian, uh, you know, I've lived in communes afterwards, and then you realise that, that the communes are very much a, uh, an agenda, you know, to program people, and, and of course, Gross w was skilled in mesmerism. Um, so, you know, he, he was sleeping with all of his um, people he was treating, but that's not uncommon f for psychiatrists. And uh, Jung, Jung was very influenced by, by Gross, and, and Jung took on a lot of the ideas about the archetype and the, and the collective unconsciousness, and, and also the theories from uh, from the Eastern mysticism. So uh, this commune, uh, Frieda was very influenced by it, and, and it was then that, that she passed on all this information to, to both D.H. Lawrence and Aldous Huxley. Other things that happened at this commune, I mean, it, 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 there's an awful lot going on, and I've written an extensive chapter on it, is that that was the start of the, almost like the vegetarian free love movement, the health movement. I mean, uh, the natural dance, uh, Isadora Duncan was there doing expressive dance, and the dance was like, Worship in Pan and, and summoning in, inner demons, and it's called um, mag mag magical unconsciousness. Um, so they set up the free movement dance schools. Um, that, that was that was also involved with sun worship, which connects to to, to Lucifer, uh, and then it all goes on to the Lucifer Trust, and uh, you know the whole United Nations agenda is is all based on Luciferian belief systems coming from Blavatsky and, and the people that were this. You know, Herman Hesse was there, spreading Eastern philosophies. So. Incredible influences. Um, Arnold Ayret, who created the, the vegetarian movement, and there was all these salons, you know. And one of the other things they did there, they set up the OTO there, uh, and they made it, it was to, to basically promote the religion, the theme, religion of Alistair Crowley, um, which you know is also very significant links to Zeno. Um, so. Uh, there was there was black magic schools, there was occult schools, and it was one of those centres. Uh, and the, the fact that the agenda was to move these communes all through the world, and it was a way of already indoctrinating the youth, you know, which has gone on right and moved into California. You know, I've done a lot of research on the counterculture there. So the whole thing with, with people like Charlie Manson and, and Lowell Canyon and the Bruderhof communes in, that spread through southern England, you know, this was the template for these communes. And of course, one of the first communes to be established was, was at, uh, at Zeno in 1917. 
And I was thought, how come all these people have just turned up in this remote village? There's not even a sign there. No one knows who it is. And of course, it was part of this spreading commune agenda. And they were joined by lots of other people as well. So that's when it, I realised that this was quite a big thing. Now, Crow, Crowley... Um, I don't know where to start with Crowley, but so I'll just confine it to, um, to how it affects um, what happened in Zeno in my book. Um, Self-styled Baphomet or Baphomet worship is, is goes back to the Knights Templars, so you know we can talk about that some other time. He was made head of the OTO, and they set up a, a lodge there called Verita Mystica, and Crowley was was running um, running all these lodges that then involved moving to other part uh, other parts of the world. But this was the first template for this this lodge to to spread um, effectively Lucif Lucifer worship and. Um, Lots of other things like, like mind control were being established here uh, and how to program the masses. So then Crowley, of course, moved on to, to Sicily where he set up a commune um, called the Abbey of Thelema. Um, and now some of the artists in, that I, know, I knew the children of you know, were at this commune as well. So there's another link between, between St. Ives and, and, and Thelema. So he set up covens as well. And he also set up a coven in Mauso, which I unearthed, which caused a lot of consternation because... Some of the one of the women that was going to it were running the local bird hospital, so they were like do gooders, and um, so yeah, he had a commune, but his communes tend to move into covens. So you know, in Thale in uh, Thalema in Sicily, one of the things that he got called the wickedest man in the world for is because they used to drink the cat's blood, you know, they drink the blood of cats. So there was a lot of um, sacrifice, animal animal sacrifice, and. Uh, Probably, you know, other stuff going on as well. So hugely significant. Now, I'm just going to briefly say about Baphomet because Baphomet is is Pan. Um, so a lot of the um, Teutonic belief systems that that come from the Knights Templars uh, that also then went through to Freemasonry uh, and also the Fabians, that, you know, were also hooked up into this is that Solve Caragula is. Um, is, is dissolving and reassembling. So part of the agenda that we're in now is, is to like reconstructing of humanity. Uh, in order to that, you've got to break everything down. So that's why the, the, the whole counterculture movement, which led to um, the Frankfurt School, you, you know, rock, rock music, it's all about breaking everything down. And um, Crowley identified with Baphomet. He called himself Baphomet, and Baphomet is, you know, also. Uh, some worship, and it goes back a long way. You can trace it back to, to um, uh, you know, mystery schools. But the fact is, it's a very significant um, concept that led to, to, to people like Alice Bailey and uh, Blavatsky and, and, and Annie Besant creating the Lucis Trust, who then created in the United Nations. And it's about combining polarities and opposites. So basically, you, you set up a Hegelian dialectic uh, and then the ultimate is androgyny, so Baphomet is an androgynous god, so this whole, as, as um, Sandy pointed out, the whole transsexual movement is, is the step towards trans, uh, transhumanism because you, you eliminate the polarities. So, you know, back in the day, Pan um, was, a, was a god of andro androgyny. Um, yeah, Crowley, it's difficult to know where to start with him, but... Um, <laughs> yeah, he, I mean, he climbed Everest. He, he set up his own yoga school. Yeah, he created a, a, a Toth Tarot. He, he was involved with a lot of high-level military intelligence. You know, people that say that he wasn't working in, uh, they just don't have got no idea. You know, he was above most most intelligent levels. And um, and of course, one of the things that interested me and people want to know about is that um, when he when he was in he ran in a coven in uh, in Newlyn in 1938. He did a ritual on the um, on the moors um, where he summoned up a Draco, uh, Draco, uh, I think it's Draco reptile, eight foot horned wing creature, that led to the death of, of Catherine Arnold Forster, who was 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 a Fabian who lived in my neighbour the house above me, which was a Fabian um, hangout, and that's where, well, we we'll move on to that because it connects to other interesting stuff regarding David Bowie and all that. Uh, this is another couple that. We're living at the time of Crowley's um, Lance's uh, commune, uh, Meredith Starr. I've written a chapter about them. It's quite hilarious. I mean, absolute fruitcake. And um, he was under the influence of Crowley, and uh, Crowley gave him an epitaph saying he, he went out of his mind and never came back. 
he was involved with just every ritual going. He, he wanted to be a wizard, astral travel, Enochian. You know, he was very knowledgeable. And he taught Lawrence, uh, introduced him to, to a lot of the literature at the time. This was one of his, um, his business partners called Meher Barber, and he was supposed to be the avatar of God. So he took him on a, on a circuit in California, uh, promoted, and he had a vow of silence for seven years, and he only communicated, communicated through an, uh, an alphabet board. So at that time, there was a lot of gurus being promoted, and a lot of them, it, it was just fake. And uh, I think his one claim to fame is that he, he coined the mantra, don't worry, be happy, which then he became a bit of a cult figure in, in Southern California with the surfers and the whole Sufi movement. And of course, all that vegetarian movement and, 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 and the free love, you know, that's all the development of the communes that were established at, at Mont Verita and also at, um, you know, at, uh, at Siena because Lawrence became a cult countercultural icon. And, uh, you know, he, to a certain extent, he was, he was used in that respect. Um, now, going on to Fabianism, I'm not going to touch on areas that, um, that the others have done, but there's another peculiar link to, to Zeno and St. Ives. In that this guy is Havelock Ellis. Now, in 1897, he was an early Fabian. Um, he was writing a book about... Uh, um, he spent 25 years writing about um, sex. Uh, basically, you know, he was an advocate of um, uh, not just homosexuality, but also other dark stuff as well, I suspect, like most Fabians, he was a kiddie fiddler. And uh, he had a um, he had a, an open marriage and, and you know that that was common then anyway among those circles, so I'm not saying anything bad about that. But uh, he lived in the Count House in um, which was later inhabited by um, Bernard Leach. And it was there that he wrote um, th this whole thing about he, he effectively did did the PR for the for the Fabian uh, movement. And ironically, again, going back to my own personal um, uh, involvement, uh, in the sense that in, in the 1990s, uh, my art dealer was living in that house. And uh, she did, I used to go there to, to, to model for life drawing. I ended up having an affair with her. And uh, so, again, I've got a connection with that house. Um, the, the, the only later did I found out that's where Havelock Ellis wrote, wrote this book. He was also the first person in 1897 to take. Uh, mescaline in this country. Now that's quite something um, because you look at it, you think, well, they're just kind of Edwardian things. But he was experimenting w with hallucinogenic drugs even then, and of course the, the whole Fabian movement, w w you know, became very interested in how these drugs could be used f f for mind control, and that al also links into into the the work that Robert Graves did, and also that I, to a certain extent, got involved with 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 the the counterculture movement and, and, and drugs and things like that uh, as a kid. So basically, he, he's another one that, that was hanging around um, St. Ives and Zeno, you know, as part of this extended crowd. A uh, very influential man. He also influenced uh, Nabokov, you know, Vladimir Nabokov, who wrote um, Lolita. And of course, we all know what that's about. And, um, and uh, the whole thing about uh, Nabokov, Nabokov was that he was a, a lepidotrist, I think it's called, which is a butterfly collector. So again, the butterfly symbolism became the monarch program. Uh, uh, and this all comes from, you know, a lot of these Fabian, um, there's a in whole intellectual background be behind what's going on, on, on now. And it's not new. Um, how are we doing for time? Fine. Okay. Um, now, this is a rather curious story and it, it's very, this is what really got me started on on doing this research into the Fabian, so that this guy is called um, William Arnold Forster, and that's Catherine Arnold Forster. And he was instrumental in, they live in a house called Eagle's Nest, which is just up the hill from me. They actually looked down on me, and um, in many ways. And um, this was where he started, uh, he was instrumental in starting the League of Nations. He was also the, the, the founder of Gordonston School. Now, at that time, uh, a guy called Kurt Hahn, who was uh, in Germany, came out of a German Jew, came out and they got him out of Germany. Uh, and it was him and, uh, and Arnold Forster that set up Gordonston School, run on mili German military lines from, from a school called uh, Salem Schosch. So, that, in a sense, that was part of this whole outdoor, you know, a lot of tapped into a lot of the Nazi, um, a lot of the Nazi philosophy was connected to, to what is now the Green Movement, in the sense that, you know, it, it, the Green Movement is just repackaged Nazism, you know, to, to appeal to a, diff a different audience. 
So they started this school, but also, you know, the League of Nations, I then came to found out, which, which then became the United Nations, an extremely sinister organisation. Um, well, I'm not going to go into that. Uh, but they, they were married, and um, they were also up to stuff, because George Mallory, the, the, um, the climber who climbed Everest, another co cohort with both Lawrence and, and Alistair Crowley, um, uh, she was the lover of Rupert Brooke, during the First World War, Rupert Brooke again, part of that whole Blues of crowd, they were all um, in, involved with, he was involved with the Cambridge Apostles. So a lot of secret societies, you know, also Freemasons, uh, and I dare say occultists as well. So it was, it was her that was partly responsible for getting Alistair Crowley um, kicked out of, of, of Cornwall because he was hanging around Zeno. He had a child um, with a woman called Pat Doherty, um, now, again, we're, t we're going into espionage here because Crowley was running, running uh, honey traps. Um, uh, th their links up to the Nazis through a guy called Lord Tredegar, who had a haunted castle. Now, Lord Tredegar was a friend with Peter Warlock. Uh, and, and even more coincidences, one of Peter Warlock's, the Satanist who lived with Lawrence, one of his girlfriends, Julie, married Thomas Huxley. So, you know, this whole world, they're all webbed up. Um, she wanted to get rid of Crowley because Crowley was supposedly doing uh, rituals on the moors in, and also in St. Berrien. And, uh, apparently, um, uh, she got the, the, the vicar of Zenor to, to throw holy water in Crowley's face. Uh, now, Crowley was there in 1938, but so was von Ribbentrop and so was Haile Selassie. So, you know, that's another rabbit hole that, that I went down uh, and I've done partly in the book, but you know, there's too many coincidences. This is all happening in, in this tiny village where I live. There's only five cottages and an eagle's nest and the church and the pub, you know, I mean, <laughs> as I said in the book, I said this is, it's a romp through the 20th century involving, um, you know, sexual scandal, sex magic, Nazi spirings. And I did that as a joke, thinking this will sell it. And then when I found out it was all, it was actually true. I'd done prescriptive programming myself. So she was, um, she went up to this haunted Khan. Uh, well, actually, Miles and Miriam came to visit it um, a couple of weeks ago. And uh, she was found dead, and, and apparently Crowley had summoned up uh, an entity. And um, he, was, he didn't even need to be in places because, um, he, you know, he could time travel and he'll also make himself invisible. So um, people say, but he wasn't there in 1938, according to his diaries. Well, no one knew where Crowley was at any particular time because he had such high-level clearance. Um, but yeah, from what I can gather, when I first heard this story, a guy had researched it called Paul Newman, who wrote a book called The Tregerthan Horror. And he did some great research linking up the Fabians, linking up occultism with, with Lawrence, with, with, with Crowley, with espionage. He only got so far because he came up against a brick wall. So I developed a lot of his research. And then he said, if anyone can s solve these problems about who was living there at the time, so I was able to, to then progress that research because of um, a because of my analytic process, and b because you know I had access to to, to people that knew these people. So Crowley's the, the mother of Crowley's child, Pat Doherty, again an incredible coincidence. I was researching Pat Doherty. I befriended an author, a lady author who who was an eminent author. I won't name her. She said, come for supper. So I went for supper. Then I found out that was the house where Pat Doherty, um, who had Crowley's moon child, um, uh, had lived and also had fostered lots of African babies <laughs> during the uh, 1930s. I didn't find out whatever happened to them or how a load of African babies were, were staying in, in Crowley's mistress's house um, as children. But there we go. Um, nobody wants to talk about that. Um, so she was, she was um, uh, part of this ritual murder. Um, uh, more interesting thing in that when he set up Gordonstone, um, his son went there. Also, it le led on to. I've got connections with David Bowie. Um, I'll chat a little bit about Bowie and his connection to Zenor, which is, I think, coming up soon. Um, but David Bowie sent his son to Gordonstone School. Uh, now, I think that was a really strange thing for a rock star to send his son to Gordonstone, which was basically run on, on Nazi military lines. Um, and it's all connected to the League of Nations. Um, okay. Anyway, their house is, is called Eagle's Nest. And many years ago, when I was going to Eagle's Nest, before I lived at Tregerthan, in fact, um, I'd put it in my sat-nav because it was at night time. And I put in 
uh, Eagle's Nest, and it said Eagle's Nest is 5,300 kilometers away. And I thought, surely it's not that far from London to Cornwall. And then I found out that, that Hitler's uh, summer house, Birch's Garden, is, is the German translation of Eagle's Nest. So the sat-nav was sending me to Hitler's summer residence in Bavaria. So I made a joke about this in the book, and then some Fabian who's tried to sue me um, about exposing this said, oh, you know, it's disgusting that you, you've mentioned uh, Arnold Forster, you know, a, a liberal Fabian, in the same breath as Hitler. Uh, and I said, well, it's not really, because, you know, he's setting up a Luciferian organisation. And, of course, that, that didn't go down at all well. And subsequently, I found out that, you know, the whole Ribbentrop stuff as well. And someone else wrote a book called Frank Baker, whose son I know. Um, and he wrote a, what's called a Roman Eclef, where he describes the, the assassination of, uh, of Arnold Forster by, by... He changed the names, obviously. Um, and also, he had a, another name for Arnold Forster as a guy who was actually a German spy. Uh, and, and that he told the whole story about Ribbentrop visiting all the time and, and how the Fabians were actually part of the uh, Nazi agenda, which you know, I actually fully endorse. Uh, not to say they're part of the agenda, but they're two sides. You know, it's all to do with bringing in the New World Order. Um, yeah, here we go, Ribbentrop. Um, people want to know about him. So fortunately, I, I've got an artist friend uh, who wrote a book about, um, about Ribbentrop's time as an artist, because Ribbentrop used to play golf with his, his father. So, you know, again, I'm connected to the children, the people that, that knew all about this. And uh, another thing is when, when I go chatting to people, I like talking to, to old people, you know, because they've got memories that only get passed down. And, and when Ribbentrop came to St. Ives, he fell in love with it and he decided this was going to be the Fourth Reich, the, the basis for the Fourth Reich, because he wanted to have uh, Tregenna Castle. Hitler wanted to have St. Michael's Mount. Well... Part of the reason is because St Michael's Mount is, is on a you know is on a ley line, so they know all about this because they had Himmler researching all the ley line energies of Cornwall. So uh, Ribbentrop was taking photographs of the coastline, sending them back to, to, to Germany. He also ingratiated himself with a lot of the uh, the local artists and the landowners. You know, some of those landowners have been landowners for hundreds of years, and of course they're all high level Freemasons, and they're also probably connected to Knights Templars. Um, you, you know. The, Cornwall being a very Freemasonic place and, and also Arthurian legend. And the Nazis were obsessed with Arthurian legend. You know, they, Himmler had a room laid out with, with the chairs like the, the round table, all connects through the Thula Society and stuff like that. So the, the Nazis have always been interested in Zenor. And I, when I first was living in St. Ives, people said, oh, well, you know, Zenor's going to be the hub for the, for the Fourth Reich. It's one of the energy centres. And I'm thinking, oh, yeah, you know, Zenor. And of course, now when I found out what I found out, it, you know, I, I wouldn't dismiss it. So he um, played golf with, with a lot of the, the uh, landowners, including Colonel Blyther, who he stayed with. Um, he also, his aide, Raina Spritzi, had an affair with Colonel Blyther's daughter. And this was a bit of a scandal at the time. And, 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 and Spritzi um, then went on to work with, with Canaris, who I think Michael Shrimpton talks about. William Canaris was, was head of the... Uh, uh, German Abwehr uh, intelligence, and um, so there's all these kind of links, and, and, and also it links in with, with um, Ribbentrop. Also had an affair with, with um, uh, Wallace Simpson, who was who was uh, Edward VIII, you know, Prince of Wales. Is um, he was gay anyway, um, but he, he had an affair with her, slept with her 17 times, and um, uh, then there was involvement with, with, with Crowley, with Rupert, with Hess about. You know, installing Edward VIII onto the, onto the throne. There's a lot of lot of stuff going on. And in fact, a lot of this was going on down in in Zeno uh, under Eagle's Nest. So you know, I, I tracked. Uh, I've mentioned Ribbentrop's um, visits there. It's, it's quite funny. Uh, this guy is also not many people know about him. Edward Ball Lytton, MP for St Ives in 1827, uh, an early dandy. Uh, he wrote a book called The Coming Race. And that in 1871, the premise of this book was that um, there was a community called the Anna who lived in, in Tibet, uh, and, and they were an ancient civilization that had advanced technology. And uh, he goes on about, he's one of the first persons to talk about Vril, uh, and, you know, the, the electricity, and it links to the Kundalini, you know, the chakras, again, a lot of that Tibetan mysticism. So he, he was also a dandy, and, and he was having an affairs with, with, um, with the Israeli and... and uh, Byron's mistress, I've got her name now. So he was an early rock star, and um, he also wrote a book called um, 
Oh, I've forgotten what his name now, but anyway. He was interested in uh, one of the first person to articulate and, uh, and write about extraterrestrial advanced civilizations coming in and inhabiting in, and capturing souls and capturing the bodies of, uh, you know, through the use of Vril. And of course, then Vril got taken up by the Thula Society, and, and the Nazis were very interested in Vril. Uh, you know. But yeah, he, he, was, um, he was a big influence on. Um, on H.G. Wells, who, who I'm going to chat about, and also on, on David Bowie, um, in a weird kind of way. Um, is that coming next? Yeah, I'm gonna, I'll come on to Bowie. I'm just, I'm just going to whisk through a bit. Yeah, here's Bowie. So Bowie's got a big connection with Zeno. Um, I've got friends who are very good friends with, with Bowie. And I was with a girl who, on the day Bowie died, in um, I was with her in the Chelsea... Um, Arts Club, a very strange man. Um, I, I'm just going to confine it to, to um, the, the Zeno connection. He, he was also heavily into the occult, um, very, very into Crowley. Um, he would only stay on the 33rd floor of hotels. Um, he was obsessed with Himmler, um, very well read man. And um, he was also very obsessed with, with, with Ball with Lytton's theories about the coming race, and I think one of his songs was uh, Oh You Pretty Things was about children being replaced by, you know, aliens. Uh, and the book was called Zanoni, um, and Zanoni was a book that Ball with Lytton read, and that was the basis for the f very good film by Nicholas Roig called The Man Who Fell to Earth. And of course, Bowie was also a very good actor, and Bowie was in this film playing this alien who, who comes to Earth, and then of course he gets... Um, caught up in all, all the addictions and vices, you know, cocaine and, and, and money magic and, uh, and, and sex and stuff like that. So uh, that was very much based on, on the theories of Edward Bulwer Lytton. Now, Bowie used to come down to, to, to Zeno quite a lot. Um, his mum, Peggy, had a uh, house in Penzance. He also had a mystery house somewhere, which nobody can locate. He used to come down in, like, disguise uh, and, and hang out. He also had a massive collection of, of St Ives art, he bought a lot, a lot of the work from people I knew at the end of their lives. And a lot of his collection was based on, on Zen, painted at Zenil. So clearly he had, he had a, you know, a, a deep interest and, and, and tapped into to, to Zenil. He was also in a film called Omricon. It was, a, it, was a pro, it was a game. He was in a game called Omricon where you get inhabited by demons and it's only a nomad spirit. Can, can, so even in 1999, I think he was in... He was also programmed into the transgender movement along with, with um, Mick Jagger. Um, but, you know, that's, that's another thing about the, about the counterculture stuff. In, in, in 1918, Crowley did a, a working called the Alimantra working where he summed up an entity called Lamb. And it, th this Alimantra working was very important because it was, it was like re re redone badly by um, Jack Parsons. It, Crowley was controlling Jack Parsons, done by Jack Parsons, led to Montauk and the Philadelphia Experiment, all that stuff. So look, that, this is the dollar bill. So this was Crowley's drawing of Lamb, the, the entity that he summoned uh, in Montauk. And, and of course, there's people that believe he opened a portal that, that brought in the, the greys. Um, so that's pretty much a clear. And that was used in, uh, in one of Blavatsky's books as well. Uh, and also it was shown in an exhibition in, in um, Greenwich Village in 1918. So you know, this is not something that's done in retrospect. And that image of Lamb is, I suppose, what you would correspond with the greys. Um, uh, Blavatsky, I'm not going to go into her, but hugely important um, thinker. Be, you know, she got involved with going to Tibet, part of the thing about having one world religion. Another thing about, about Zenor is that when I first started going to Zenor, there was always monks around, Tibetan monks. And even the farm I stayed in now, um, when I first went there in, when, on my honeymoon, many years ago. Uh, it was owned by Richard Long, an artist. There were monks staying there, and they were walking across the field to the Tinder's Arms in Orange. You know, I didn't know what, what was going on, but there was all rumours that Dalai Lama tried to buy the Khan, the haunted Khan that was Crowley's place. And of course, Dalai Lama, uh, you know, tried trafficking and all that stuff. And, and the whole Buddhist thing is a, a CIA operation. Uh, you know, Dalai Lama, Gandhi, the lot of them, Mother Teresa, were crooked, the lot of them. You know, child trafficking, all that. Um, right, Fabian Society. Oh, this is a big story. Um, to be brief, a wolf in sheep's clothing. Um, 
that's the whole thing about Fabius. It's all done by deception, and it comes from Fabius Maximus, who um, defeated Hannibal by just attrition, by not attacking. So basically, they play a long game, uh, and the Fabians you know, are controlled by the Freemasons, and the Freemasons are controlled by the Illuminati, and the Illuminati, I dare say, are linked to, to the Anunnaki. So you, know, you can trace a link back to the Fabians. The Fabians have been running this country uh, politically, uh, and of course, all the usual suspects, the Huxleys, uh, Sidney Webb, Karl Marx, they, you know, goes back to Darwin. We haven't got time to talk about Darwin, but I've got great stuff on, on, on Darwin and, and all the inbred family that he had, um, including the Huxleys. Um, so that, yeah, Fabian, you know, other people are, are, are going to talk about that, but very, very deep. Um, well, well Fa Fabian is, is, is based on gradualism. So basically, it's a long game. Uh, and what they did, they, um, they had various agendas, like the transgender agenda. Um, they have a Hegelian dialect where they play, play by the side, so they would, they would be... Um, a lot of it came out of LSC as well, so th they would have, like, Trotsky, who was a Fabian agent. Um, a lot of people like Bertrand Russell. Uh, got a load of dirt on him as well in, in Cornwall. Um, but basically, it's a load of families, like the Darwins, the Huxleys. They all interbreed with each other. And their theory, Darwin's theory was that by the time Darwin was alive, all the famous, all the best families had already uh, existed. So it's all part of this, uh, the population entropy eugenics program. The eugenics program is, is very linked up to, to Fabianism. So, you know, a lot of these um, things like Huxley, you know, they, they can sterilisation. Uh, it's to do with getting rid of, of the peasants, you know, the useless eaters, you know, all that stuff. Uh, they believe that they're, elite, they're an elite they're in charge, and they have been. Um, so I'm, I'm really whizzing through this, but War of the World... H.G. Wells, hugely significant, uh, in, in the same sense that, that Aldous Huxley and, and George Orwell, because I'm a literature. Um, I come at, come at things from a literary point of view, so I look at the, the philosophical belief systems that are behind you know, the New World Order uh, uh, and the depopulation agenda. So I'm not coming at it from necessarily the same angle as other people because I've done a lot of, uh, you know, uh, of studying about philosophy and the philosophy and, and the literature of the time, like, you know, Dadaism and, and, uh, and music. So H.G. Wells was, was really one of the godfathers of, of the science fiction movement, very influenced by um, Paul Willett and also a great influence on people like Ron Hubbard and Jack Parsons. So, you know, he was talking about the War of the Worlds where... Surrey gets invaded by Martians, uh, and basically th they need human blood. Uh, so it's almost as if th there's, a, there's an alien race uh, th that are colluding with, with our elites, and, and basically the, the rest are just food. Uh, so War of the Worlds was e extremely important, and of course that was taken up by, um, by Orson Welles um, in 1938 with, with his fantastic um, scam where there's been a fake... Martian invasion, and of course this is all comes from Wells, and that all links into Project Bluebeam. Which, so the fact that Pro Project Bluebeam hasn't just come out of the woodwork, and this has been something that goes back to, to Orson Wells, and then prior to that with with uh, H.G. Wells. So H.G. Wells was very much part of this Fabian crowd, and they were instrumental in setting up the Fabian Society, and it's all based on fake socialism. So you know the whole neoliberalism is it, it, just another Hegelian dialect. So they get. They get communists, they get capitalists, they get socialists. You know, they, they control the lot. You know, um, they control both sides, and, and they don't mind that, that, that two sides are warring with each other because, at the end of the day, the ultimate is the new world order. Uh, now, new world order. H.G. Wells wrote, wrote a book called The New World Order in 1940. So, like George Bush didn't invent this. I mean, you know, this is this is a Fabian agenda. Um, other books he wrote in 1897, The Invisible Man, The Time Machine. I mean, incredible. You know, that time travel. So they knew what was going on. So even like I mentioned to, to Lucy today, George Orwell, you know, everyone thinks he's a prophet. Well, he's not because uh, he was another Fabian, Eton, Eton Freemasonry Lodge, and um, his father was running the drugs trade out of um, from the East India Company, you know, Eric Wormsley Blair. So when he wrote 1984, he, that's the agenda. They're manifesting the, the program that they're about to in, in, install. Um, I want to talk about a bit about graves. So. Uh, Thomas, Julian Huxley, another very sinister. I, I knew some of the Huxleys when I was hanging out with Robert Graves, and they're a really weird family. Bertrand Russell is another one. His, his name, nickname was Mephisto, um, vampire. You know, and it was him uh, 
Principia uh, Mathematica 1913 that, that set up the whole thing about God is dead, entropy, you know, the Big Bang Theory, and then, of course, one of his students, Wein Norberg, Norberg Wein, Weinhardt, something like that, that set up the whole modern game theory that, that, that we are just data, and that led on to the Yuval Harari and, and the whole movement where it all started with him, you know, the ultimate uh, logician. And it, it, it was based on the premise, that, that the fake Darwin premise about the theory of evolution, which was another load of old bollocks. So um, the, the Fabian agendas, they're, they're massive. Like, he's got a massive influence with, with, with Cornwall as well because Lawrence was going to bring him down to stay in the commune. He was one of the ones considered. And um, he wouldn't have stuck it. But in any case, um, his granddaughter set herself on fire in St. Berrien Churchyard in 1975. She was inv got involved with satanic practices, as everyone does when they go to St. Berrien. Um, he also had a house at Porth Kerno, underground cables, first internet, linking up the British Empire. Um, we're running out of time, but Frankenstein, hugely important, hugely important book, uh, metaphor for the Illuminati. Uh, Frankenstein was written at Ingolstadt, which is where Adam Weishaupt set up the Illuminati in 1776. Uh, Byron Shelley, partly of Rosicrucians, you know, part of that elite crowd, Masons. Uh, Frankenstein represented uncontrolled science, rampaging across Europe. Uh, Adam Weishaupt w was the front man for, again, as, as uh, I can't remember which one of you said, it links back to Venice. You know, the whole Venice Doge thing was very, you know, very important. Um, Robert Graves, yeah, he, he taught me the analytic process. How can I say this very quickly? I, I had mine files from, from Graves downloaded. Um, I've lived in Graves' houses. I've, I've dated his granddaughter. I've had a whole load of um, synchronicity w w since the first time I met Graves. He taught me analeptic writing. I, wrote, I published my book, Moon in Leo, in 1977, based on pagan myths that, that you don't need to research. You can, you can time travel uh, and go back. And, and he, he was the one that, that developed the whole thing about brainwashing because in Daya, this magic village, which is another Zeno, one of those spirits of place. His neighbour was a guy called William Sargent, who um, w was instrumental in, in running uh, the sleep rooms, British psychiatry, you know, he, <coughs> testing children, the Gorton Foundation, they, they tested me with the IQ tests in, in the, in the 50, 60s. So I know all about William Sargent. And it was him that passed on all Graves' information to, to Dr. Ewan Cameron, uh, Dr. Evil, who then used it to set up mind control. And it was all just Huxley was, was the go-between, because Huxley was hanging around with Graves just like he was hanging around with Lawrence. Uh, and they, they got all this information out of Graves, and Graves was also an expert on, on magic mushrooms. So all, all the experiments that Graves did with hallucinogenics, you know, well, I did hallucinogenics at that, uh, you know, as well, so I was partly in that program of... Uh, took my first tab at Isla White in 1970. Uh, but his expertise was passed on to the CIA by a guy called Robert Gordon Wasson, and Huxley was the facilitator to that. So then they spread their lodges all through, their communes all through Southern California, got everyone hooked on that. They were involved with, with running Charlie Manson, um, the whole MK Ultra program, Cameron, very deep, very dark, and um, they didn't really care how, you know, Graves was ignorant of all of this. He was just used as an artist, like Lawrence was used as an artist, because they could tap into things that, that logical minds couldn't. So that's what I'm saying about, about the DNA and the gypsy stuff. You know, you can see connections that other people can't see. And um, Sergeant, um, yeah, hugely influential uh, in many ways w with um, what went on with MK Ultra. Um, as was this guy. I'm not, not going to talk about him, you and Cameron, but yeah. He, he was running McGill University. You know, Leonard Cohen was an MK Ultra um, mind control, you know. Look him up. I haven't written about this in the book. I've, I've more or less confined it to Zeno, but I knew that I did some interviews with, with Miles on basis, something, and we were chatting about about the mind control. You know how they how they mind brainwash children, and, and also more pertinently, how they brainwash, how they run the counterculture. So I, I, I'm nearly finished now. But this again, bringing it forward, Lucifer is the god. Uh, the secret of Freemasonry above 33 is that Lucifer is God. The Luciferian belief system runs the United Nations. Um, it runs the WHO, it runs everything. Uh, and it all goes back to Knights Templars. It's Kenneth Anger, he made a film called Lucifer Rising. Um, 
involving Mick Jagger. I can't talk about Mick Jagger because I know the family, um, Marion Faithful, but I know all about Marion Faithful's father was, was in MI5. And it was him that he debriefed Himmler. So the links between the counterculture and British intelligence, and of course Mick went to LSE. Um, anyway, that, that's a whole... That's a whole, a whole new story with, with um, people like Kenneth Anger and, and Anton Levay. And of course, it all dates back to Crowley because Crowley is running, running all those lodges. You know, he's running the, the, all those occult um, movements like the Eon of Horus, which is where we are now. Well, I've rambled on there. So, so <laughs> any questions? Um, was Dylan Thomas involved? Yeah, Dylan Thomas w was, was involved. Um, in the sense that he was living in, when he married Caitlin, he was living in a village called Lamorna, which is a very haunted village. And I actually lived in Mousel for some time. I was living with the granddaughter of Augustus John, and, and, uh, uh, and Dylan Thomas was in that world with, with Augustus John. Now, Dylan Thomas wasn't involved in the occult, as far as I know. He, he was terrified of Crowley, because Crowley was there at that time. Um, but I think he was, t you know, he was a serious alcoholic, but a seriously brilliant poet. So I don't think he dabbled in any of that. Mine's, mine's a slight, very quick story, Go on, then. which is, gives a slight up thing to everything you're talking about, is to do with Alistair Crowley. My mother was a medium, reluctant, and she has left all this information about it, so that it's almost like a manual for humanity and how we should be. Anyway, sometime I work as a physio, or used to work as a physiotherapist, acupuncturist, and I'm a natural healer. And I used to have this couple as patients. He had plenty of money. You know, they just do anything they like. And she was the daughter of some publishers. I think they had a newspaper thing. Anyway, <clears throat> he said to me one day, he said, I'm very sorry. He said, I've given your number to my mad sister-in-law. I said, oh, well, that's fine. Thank you very much. Anyway, she rings me up, and she's got a gin and fags voice. And she shed, said she lived in the penthouse flat just next to um, the Vauxhall Bridge. Would I come and see her? So I went along, took my couch. She opens the door with a fag hanging out of her mouth, a tennis machine around her, and completely naked. And I go into this filthy flat, which is about the size of a postage stamp. Boxes of booze everywhere. Her, her will up at the top the bathroom with no soap, no towels, just KY jelly and evening primrose <laughs> oil. And the, 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 draw, the, the drawing room, whatever you like to call it, she had a, a sort of stuffed owl or a crow or something and all these dreadful books that she'd written. Take it away, it's red. My father to the devil has gone and all this stuff, you know. Anyway, I treated her. And I came away with the most profound feeling of terrible depths of depression. Awful, 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 awful. And it took about two days to go. And then I went back to see her again. And I thought, I, I, you know, it, it had left me. And I just saw this pathetic woman, really, who had a boyfriend down, or a man she used to go and see down in Bristol, who loved her. I'm being very quick. And he used to go down and see her, and that, that was her sanity, really. And then I came back, I was living in this flat on my own at the time, and there was a big thing about Alistair Crowley. And I thought he was the most pointless human being that you could ever come across. He was just devoted to wickedness. And in this thing, they were talking about the thing in Sicily. And she apparently was an American woman who had... Um, been his complete slave. Mm. She had had sex with animals, sex with this person, that person, the other person. In the, she had a couple of children with him, I think. Yeah, in that the was end, Leah Hersig. Is that who it was? <laughs> anyway, in the end, she became so depressed and so de desperate, which was yeah. what I'm my mother's yeah. daughter. I was picking it up. So that was obviously her come back, and she killed herself. She threw herself yeah. off a rock. Anyway, what they were saying was that they felt profoundly sorry for her. So they're giving her another chance. So she's meeting a man who loves her and trying to get her out of this awfulness. So there you go. Perhaps, well, I don't think a lot of these people... Thank you. God. Thank you very much, Jane. That's called a statement, not a question. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. Uh, Bob. Bob. 
Thank you very much <laughs> indeed. Thank you very much. Great, great, great. There are some uh, books. I've got some books there. We've done a lot with Bob. We've done about six parks uh, with Bob uh, for the bases. There's another two stuck on a computer that blew up. And there's a lot more. This is a very long, complicated story. And thank you for your work and your research and also your hospitality down at Zenner. Take Thank up. you very much. Okay, we're now going to reframe for the final presentation of the day, and that will be Lucy uh, Wyatt.